All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started here. First of all, welcome tonight to our third and final seminar event of the year. Appreciate you all being here. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if everybody can please remove your hats and stand, we'll say a quick pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the flag with the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ken, where's the flag? <laughs> 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 All right. All right. Well, again, thank you everybody for being here. A little bit lighter crowd than we usually have for these, but that's all right. Um, so tonight, being the final one, we're going to give away this awesome Yeti cooler with its packed full of stuff. The total value of everything in there is somewhere around twelve or thirteen hundred bucks. And if you came to one seminar, you got one chance at it. If you come to two, you got uh, ten for the second one, so you've got eleven. And if you've been here for all three, you're going to end up with fifty chances. And based on the crowd, maybe a lot of repeat attendees here tonight. So hopefully, somebody that's here wins, and not somebody that's only been here one time and is not here tonight. Um, Quick recap on the seminar series this year. We've had some great speakers and some great topics. We started off at the beginning of the year, at the end of January, and we had the DC biologist, Ryan Rockefeller, talk to everybody about all of the different types of tags that were available and how we might be able to get more doe tags than what you knew about. A lot of information there, and we also had that night the sheriff of Allegheny County, Scott Cicerello, talk to us about what the new gun laws in New York were and how that affects kind of our day-to-day -day and what the what the process if you get in trouble is and, and all that. There was a lot of good good information there too. The next seminar we were here in uh, I think it was early March. We had Steve Shirt talk about big buck movement in the big woods and he had a lot of data that was there was a lot of data there but it was kind of interesting to see what he was able to come up with with his hundred and something trail camera study that he does every year. Then Billy Harvey who's here tonight, him and his buddy Dallas, they talked about how they put together a big woods DIY deer hunt on public land and they showed a lot of really interesting things on the map on how they push deer around ridges and points and everything and how they set everything up and talked a lot about the gear that they take out in the woods and, and the good camaraderie that they have on their trips and that was a really interesting talk as well. And tonight, we were lucky enough again this year to bring Kip Adams back, which I'm sure he won't disappoint and he's got couple of different topics that he'll talk to us about that with three days left here in New York before our opener, only two for you and PA, right? Saturday. Right. One and a half uh, now. Yeah, one and a half. He's got some great stuff that he'll talk to us about tonight that'll get us right in the mindset and help us get ready for being out in the woods and in a tree for bow season. So without any more, go right. ahead, Kip. Thanks. One and a half left for us, but, uh, but who's counting, right? <laughs> I can tell you three people in my household who have been counting down. And uh, so, uh, this is awesome. Uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to come back here. You know, I live so close to this. So uh, most times that, that I'm on the road for work involves an airplane somewhere. So the fact that I can drive makes it nice. I actually spoke at a conference at State College yesterday. So uh, two days in a row that I was on the road and, uh, and got to be near home. And uh, this is really close to home. So uh, very, very appreciative uh, to be here. And for what the branch does to providing this opportunity uh, here in the area. So um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're excited about the, the pending season. I know you guys are starting right after us. I'm guessing we have at least a few bow hunters in here. So uh, uh, hopefully you've been seeing some nice deer. Um, stands are all set in that, and, uh, and you're set to hit the woods as well. So uh, what, uh, what I have here tonight, a couple different things. One is, as you can see, biology and behavior. Um, perfect time of the year to talk about some of the things with deer relative to, you know, how they act, how they're interacting with others. Definitely can help us get a little closer to them, whether we hunt them with a bow or a rifle or just a camera. Maybe you don't hunt at all. Maybe you're just a deer enthusiast. So uh, we'll share some information with deer. What I'm going to start with is just a few statistics from our 2023 deer report. Um, actually, I have a few copies here that, uh, that you're welcome to grab. All of this data comes from each of the state wildlife agencies. We do this every year. Big national uh, survey. Actually, we're getting all the data in right now from this past hunting season. It's amazing how long it takes some states to actually get all their data in and then analyze it. It's often months after the end of the season, which, which 
I just can't believe it. It shouldn't take that long, we'll say that. But there are many states that it does. So our, our report comes out every January. The data I'm gonna show you are from our 2023 deer report. This, all of our deer reports are, are a free download on our website at deerassociation.com if you wanna go and grab any of them, see how your state fits in compared to your neighbors or others. But I'll share some harvest statistics from the most recent season that all the data is there, which was the 21 into 22 uh, deer season. So again, everything is from this. It is amazing now, we have been tracking the percentage of all the bucks that are shot that are just one and a half years old since the late 80s. In this past year, the number now is about 27%. So only about one in four of all antler bucks shot are just one and a half years old. This is crazy how this has changed over the past three decades. You know, it used to be somewhere between seven and nine bucks that were shot were just one and a half, and it's all the way down to about a quarter. And this is stabilized here. It dropped a bunch over the last two decades, but really within about the last five years, it has stabilized at right at 24 to 27%, which is pretty cool with this. So it's near the lowest national average ever reported. And here in New York, it was 39%. This is a really good place to be and by far one of the best places you have ever been. This is basically right in line with what we are in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was 38%, but we, we bounced between 38 and about 41%. So essentially what this means is you are in so much better shape than you were in the past. Is there room to improve? Sure, there's always room to improve, but it's very, very different than it was 10 years ago or certainly 20 years ago. So if the lower number of yearling bucks continues to decline, that means then the number of older bucks has got to be bigger. And that is in fact true. All the bucks that were shot in the US, 40% of them were at least three and a half years old. It means it might've been three, four, five, six or older, but uh, about 40%. And this is near the highest national has ever reported. It's been up to I think 41 or 42% at the top. But it's crazy to think now where that is, to think 40% of all the deer are in those middle aged or fully mature age classes, which is pretty cool. In New York, you guys are at about a quarter. This is a good place to be. We can't compare it to Pennsylvania on this one because Pennsylvania doesn't age anything past two and a half. The age yearlings, two and a half plus, they put those all together. So uh, they are one of the few states that don't break it out to uh, one and a half, two and a half, or three and a half plus, unfortunately. Luckily, New York does. Your agency does collect enough data and break it out. And to think that about a quarter of all the bucks that are shot hit that three or older age class it is pretty cool. Now, you do obviously have mandatory restrictions in a few places of the state. Almost all of this has been voluntary. And almost all of this is driven by hunters just like yourself that have told others, hey, there's a lot of value in passing yearling bucks. You know, you should do this too and have the ability to hunt these when they get a little bit older. You know, what's amazing is to think that in Pennsylvania, we do have mandatory restrictions. You essentially have done exactly the same thing we have without having mandatory restrictions statewide. Um, I know some hunters want them statewide, some don't. Wherever you are on that argument, it doesn't matter. The reality of it is through a strong educational campaign from your state wildlife agency and a lot of education from branches like this and hunters, you guys have essentially achieved the same thing Pennsylvania has. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty darn cool. All right, hunter success rates. What percentage do you think of all the hunters that go out actually kill the deer? I think it's pretty high or is it pretty low? 18%. It's actually pretty darn low. Less than half of all the hunters that go out are gonna shoot a deer any given year. Now think about it, think of your deer, how many, you know, some states limit you to one buck, a lot of states let you have two bucks. Almost every state lets you have multiple antlerless deer. State of Georgia, where a bunch of my colleagues are, you buy a license, you get the opportunity in most of that state to kill 10 antlerless deer in addition to two bucks. But yet, if you take a look across the country, only about 40% of all the hunters that go afield this year are gonna shoot a deer. That's crazy low. And only, well, you guys are actually a little bit below that. So about a third of your hunters. But the 18% he talked about, that's about what the percentage of folks that shoot more than one. So less than half of all the hunters are going to kill one deer. Less than one out of five are going to shoot more than one. How many of you in here shoot more than one deer each year? You guys are the one percenters, for sure. You know, I know at the Adams household, we are definitely shooting more than one a year because we eat multiple deer a year. This is what, if you look at folks like you, and I'm guessing the people that you hunt with, the people that you run with and talk with, 
we are the ones in many cases that are doing the lion's share of the work when it comes to actually managing deer herds. Meaning we're the ones that are shooting the majority of antlerless deer. They get harvested. Oftentimes the ones passing those younger bucks. So, uh, you know, kudos to you. And then for the efforts that you have at literally shooting antlerless deer. Now, can we shoot more? You know what? Most of the country, we need to shoot more antlerless deer than we are today because we have fewer hunters. We have hunters that are aging out and then they just aren't taking as many deer. So in many cases, you know, if there's an opportunity to shoot another antlerless deer in that is needed for that area, folks like you and NDA members across the country are the ones that are often showing up at the plate and actually making that happen. So this is pretty crazy. And what percentage of New York hunters do you think shoot more than one deer? <coughs> it's about 8%, so less than one out of 10. So you clearly are the one percenters yeah. who are here that to be able to do that. So, so many people choose not to shoot an antlerless deer or shoot because they, you know what, they give away all these tags, all these deer getting shot. The reality of it is, this is it. You know, there's not that many people out there that are actually shooting a deer at all, let alone shooting more than one. So, if you've got a chance this year, maybe to take an extra doe, provide it. You know, if you, if you don't need the meat, be able to share it with a needy family or, or somebody. Uh, that's a great use of that. Deer herd is healthier because of it. Habitat's healthier. Hunters look like a champion to society because we're feeding people. Do you know what the percentage of the U.S. households today that are food insecure are? It's like 10%. 10% of the households today don't have enough food in our country. Can you imagine, in our country, 10% of them don't have enough. This is a great way for hunters to literally be champions of society. Shoot an extra deer and be able to provide it to one of those families. Each deer averages about 50 pounds of meat, which equates to about 200 meals. It's 200 quarter pound hamburgers. So uh, there's a lot of venison donation programs at the state level, which are great. A lot of our branches help with venison donation programs, which are great. And there's a lot of hunters that just simply know of somebody who needs something, either donate a deer here or give them some packages or whatever. That, that's a great use of that. So uh, I, I strongly encourage you, you know, give some meat away to somebody you know that may need it this year or even give them a whole deer. So a uh, great way to make hunters look really good in the eyes of our, of our general public, most of which that do not hunt. All right, what about private land deer harvest? What percentage of deer do you then get shot on private land? We'll start nationally. Is it half? Is it more than half? Most. More Man, than it is most. It's almost 90%. So 88% uh, of all the white tail shot annually get shot on private land. So thank God we have public land, and we need to have more, and we need to do a better job managing the public land that we have so it is good hunting. But at the end of the day, the vast majority of white tails that get shot get shot on private land which is why it's so important for our state wildlife agencies to engage with private landowners and to have be good partners there. You know, at one point, almost every state could just dictate, this is what's gonna happen and here we go. That's very different today. Agencies engage hunters at a, high, or a much higher rate than they ever had before, and that's a really good thing. Partly for things like this. This ranges a little bit around the country from 57% in Massachusetts to 99% in Texas, that's because all Texas is almost entirely private land. Uh, the Northeast, it's about eight out of 10 bucks are shot on private land. The Midwest, it's a little higher. The Southeast is even higher. I wanna to get to this. Once we get to the West, the Western US, many states don't differentiate between white tail and mule deer harvest, um, but they don't kill that many deer in the Western US anyway. A lot of wide open lands, a lot of incredible country, a lot of hunting opportunities. But in Pennsylvania, we shoot over 300,000 deer a year. You're a little bit behind that, not far behind that. You know how many deer they shoot in the entire Western US? Draw a line at the Rocky Mountains. From there west, total white tails of mule deer are only about 200,000. Like we kill more deer in Pennsylvania than the entire Western US does. So even if you added all of the West deer in the West and said, yeah, they're all on public land, that still doesn't move this needle. It's still about nine out of 10 deer uh, are shot on private land. So what is it in New York? Do you know? New York doesn't either. You guys don't, don't record that. <laughs> we don't record that in Pennsylvania either. There's a handful of states that when they get the harvest data in, there's not a good, there's not a way to measure, yes, this was harvest on private land. Some states do, some states make you report that part of it. Here's where, um, but there's some states that don't, Pennsylvania doesn't, uh, New York doesn't either. And 
there's some discrepancy here, particularly in Massachusetts, where they had they led the country. 57% of their deer were shot on private land, which means 43%, that's the highest thing, 43% of the deer were shot on public land. That's what is reported to the agency. However, follow-up surveys with that, a lot of those people were actually hunting on private land. They had permission to be there, so in their mind, that was public hunting land because anybody could go and hunt. So they record them as being public land deer, when in reality, they were private land deer. So this is a minimum estimate. So, uh, so it's you know, conservatively, 88% of it probably is even a little bit higher. So end of the day, almost all the white tails that we shoot are shot on private land. It was that way last year. It'll be that way again this year. So this is why it's so important to have private landowner programs, either through, you know, habitat stuff, DMAP programs, et cetera, from our state wildlife agencies. Otherwise, we couldn't even come close to managing white-tailed deer herds. All right, with that then, let's shift gears and talk about some biology, and then, and then we'll talk about behavior. If you look around the country, white-tails are some of the most wide-ranging animals we have, from way up into Canada, all the way down into South America. And technically, there's supposed to be 38 subspecies of deer. In reality, there probably are not that many. It's probably a lot fewer, because a lot of these subspecies descriptions were based on differences in size or maybe a little difference in coloration and they were des designated way before we knew all that much about DNA and could do actual DNA sequencing. So if they redid all of this, there's probably a lot closer to just half that many subspecies. So, uh, but either way, we do know there's a bunch of them and they exist over a wide range. We know there's big size differences. So as you get closer up into Canada, huge deer, deer that routinely will go over 350 pounds Get down at the other end where it's a lot warmer. They don't need to be that big. Like key deer, this subspecies, you know, a big old mature buck is going to max out at about 75 pounds live weight. So we have huge differences. And in general, the farther you go north, the bigger they will get. Partly, this is what they need to do to be able to survive winter. So as soon as you get into any type of, a, of tough weather, a lot of snow, a lot of cold, being bigger definitely helps with this. That's why we see this difference. We know from a movement standpoint that deer are crepuscular, which means they move most at dawn and most at dusk, those two time periods of the day. And what this graph is showing you is all different time periods of the year during summer and fall and pre-run and run and all that. And what every single one of them show is right here about daylight, we, get a, we have a bump in movement, slows down during the middle of the day, and then a big bump at dusk. These are all based on GPS radio studies Deer are wearing their GPS radio collar so they know exactly where that deer was and can get multiple fixes of that deer during the course of the day. So they know exactly when they're moving, they know how far they're moving, they know what the environmental variables are that are making it move or not making it move, moon phase, wind, all of this goes into this. But uh, this doesn't mean that deer don't move during the day. You know, we see deer moving during the day, but what this shows is they move most at dawn and dusk and then not as much during the, the daylight hours. This correlates perfectly with how they see and when their eyes are the absolute best relative to all of the other predator eyes that are out there that are trying to get them. So, deer are crepuscular. We also know that deer are individuals. Some bucks tend to move a lot, others not so much. Some does tend to move a lot, others not so much. Some have big home ranges, some have little. We like to simplify this and say, you know, bucks have a home range that's about this size and does this size. The reality of it is every one of them has a different personality, just like all of us in here. Some of us tend to talk more than others. Some of us like to travel. Some of us like to be home buys. Deer are exactly the same way. We can learn a lot more about, you know, the deer that, on the properties we get to hunt with trail cameras. Some deer, you know, you get to see, man, you get pictures of them all the time. Others, you might get a picture, you know, once a week or once every couple weeks. So. These are all from these radio collared uh, movement studies again, and we know more about deer movement today than ever before because of it. The, the radio collar revolutionized what we know about deer, and then when they added that GPS component to it, that really took our knowledge to a whole nother level about what deer are doing. Do you notice a difference with age with that as well, though? With that one, um, we used to think that as bucks got older, their home range would get larger because they're, they're able to secure more breeding rights. And, shrinks, and the reality is that uh, some two-year-old bucks have huge, huge home ranges, some two-year-old bucks have small home ranges. 
In general though, their home range will get a little larger as they get older until they're fully mature, and then you start to see the home range shrinking some. Okay. You still have some older bucks with huge home ranges, but in general, um, you do see that start to get a little smaller once they hit usually that five to six year old age yeah. class. I've had deer that I, you were a ghost for oh. years, and then when they're six and a half, I mean, you see them almost every hunt. Mm. Yep. So. <clears throat> well, deer are prey species, and a lot of the, the attributes that they have are a direct reflection of us, such as their eyes. Their eyes are on the side of their head as opposed to a predator's eyes like a coyote or a wolf that are in the front. You know, they're made for looking straight and being able to pinpoint movement. The way the deer's eyes are on the side, it allows them to see at about 300 degrees around them. So there's a little blind spot directly behind them, but not much. So even if they're looking here, and if you're over here, they're gonna see that. And they have that long, thin pupil that is designed to catch movement. So deer cannot look at the back and say, you know, I see a upper Genesee River branch. I can see a deer logo. I can read those things. Deer couldn't read any of that because that tends to all be a blur. But if anybody in the back so much as flicks a finger or over here and moves up, the eyes are designed to catch that movement. And then they will look at that and then they will move because they're trying to get that movement, whatever that was, to move again the way that they see things to be able to try to figure out exactly what it is. That's why there are times, you know, a deer, if it can't smell, it can literally walk right up to you. And if you're not moving and you're blending in, not realize anything is there. And at other times, you know, you can be 100 yards away behind them like this, and, you know, and you move a little bit and they lock on. It's that long, thin pupil with those eyes sit at the side that allows them to do this. Their nose is really good. So eyes, yeah, they are great. The nose is off the charts good relative to, to what it can do. So how much better is it than our nose? You can read in the, the outdoor magazines every year how much times it is better. But the reality of it is we don't know. We don't know exactly. You can't say it's a thousand times better or a hundred thousand times better. <coughs> Nobody knows for sure because you can't measure that. But what we do know is it is infinitely better than what we have. Because, you know, we have a nose here. And this is about the extent of all of the cells that we have that are detected, you know, from an olfactory standpoint. On a deer, its nose is not just that black thing at the end of its it actually runs all the way from its nose up to its brain, and it's, it runs back and forth inside the skull, and all of those are sensory cells that are able to detect more scent. So it's a 50,000 times, 100,000 times. The answer is probably, yeah, it's closer to probably 100,000 times better than ours, but the reality is you can't put a number on it. We don't know for sure. Um, Mike? Can we go back to eyes for a second? Sure. Vision. There's a lot of stuff out there about deer being able to see ultraviolet light <clears throat> on clothing. Yep. Do you buy into that? They absolutely can. Okay. And the reason with that is deer are essentially red-green colorblind. So that orange sign in the back, that looks green to them. They don't have the ability to see into that red spectrum. So anything that's red or orange just looks green. However, they see really good into the blue wavelengths. So they see blue really good, they see yellow really good, so you should never hunt with blue jeans. But because of they see so good into the blue end, that, that all, that's where the ultraviolet part comes in. And a lot of what we see camouflage today, it's not so much that the camouflage pattern is not working, most of the camouflage, the way it's built is what's not working. It starts over a white shirt or a white coat, then the camo is placed on top of that. So what that means is it's the white that's underneath that makes the whole thing start to glow a little bit. And because they see so good into the, the blue wavelengths, that's what they can see. So some of the best camo is not so much in the actual pattern, it's in how that's made. And if it's made over anything that starts as a blank white or a white blank, that is not good. You are far more likely to be detected. Now the ultraviolet conditioners in that is designed to let's get rid of that ultraviolet light so they can't see it as good so it can help from that but if, this, if that camo garment is started on white then you're never going to get rid of all of it okay. so th so that absolutely is true and it's because they see so good into the blues okay. and that's why you should never worry about wearing fluorescent orange hunting and i can't tell you how many people will complain about wearing a fluorescent orange <coughs> sure hunt but yeah they'll go hunting in blue jeans i mean blue jeans are like a beacon shining they're just like because they see so good. So never wear blue, never wear yellow. So uh, other colors, you're fine. Yes, sir. 
Will a black light tell you uh, the clothing you should and should not? It certainly can help you see some, where some of those ultraviolet colors are. I don't know if that would, would tell you, I don't know if it would be the same to our eyes. For instance, putting it on, if you can see a bunch of white come through, I promise you, dear Ken, there might be a garment that you can't see white through. I won't promise you that deer can't as well, but if you can see it, deer definitely can. That, that would be a safe bet for sure. So, all right, their nose then, really, really good. And this is the thing that in most cases we need to beat if we're gonna get close to deer. We're never gonna beat them all the time with that because there's nothing available to completely eliminate our scent. And even if there was, we're making new scent every time you breathe. Every breath you take, scent is given off. Your skin, your dead skin cells, every second. So there's always, so the best way to beat that is to get yourself as scent free as possible. Um, whether that be, you know, scent free wash, you know, scent free clothes, keep them in a tote, whatever it is. But more than anything else, you just need, it's in all in how you position yourself relative to where that wind is or where those thermals are to the deer. Now, what I tell people is there are certainly things that can help mask your scent. Um, and I have some friends that are diehard that, that love the, the ozonics and the charcoal and they go to all that stuff. It enhances their hunt by taking their scent control to the nth degree. So they like that. I have other friends that just get so irritated with all that that it really detracts from the hunt. So I tell them, don't do it. Hunt with the wind, but hunting is supposed to be fun. So use whatever level of that scent control that you have fun with and then use that, knowing that you absolutely can do some stuff to mask what you have, you're never gonna get rid of all of it. So be within that spectrum, you know, like wherever is comfortable for you. My friends that tend to be a little more on there relative to scent control, oftentimes are more successful. I think maybe a little bit because of the scent control efforts, more so though, because they just tend to pay that much more attention to detail to everything they do for that hunt. So uh, I don't think it's totally scent control related. I think it's more just in how they approach the whole thing. So, all right, ears. Deer actually hear very similar to what we do. If a deer takes an ear, a hearing test just like us, it's almost exactly the same. The big difference are one, they have those big old ears out there that can move and they can funnel sound. If you ever try to listen to something way off in the distance, you know, and you go like this, exactly what deer ears do all the time. It's helping catch that sound and funnel it in. And deer are so attuned to what's going on in their environment. If we're in here and there's a bunch of chatter going on and something, you know, somebody drops a fork in the back or whatever, yeah, you, know, you may hear it, you may not. But if you get in your truck and go home tonight, and on the way home, suddenly it makes a little different sound. Do you recognize it? You absolutely do. You know, your wife may not rec my wife may not recognize it. <laughs> we'll say that. As I show up in my daughter's car because my wife blew my truck up. True story. <laughs> so my wife, I'm sure the ladies here would totally recognize it. My wife wouldn't recognize another sound. But if... Same thing with deer in the environment, in the woods. They know what sounds are supposed to be there. So if you scratch some leaves or whatever, yeah, that's not that big of a deal. But you're sitting in your tree stand and you're at arrow, if you're still shooting aluminum arrows, that aluminum arrow hits the stand or whatever, you know, deer will lock onto that so fast because that's not a normal sound. So they hear very similarly we do. They just are way more in tune to what's going on out there. They have to be. They're a prey species. You know, they don't live long if they're not in tune. So, cool thing too, though, is the way they're built, one stomach, four chambers, though. They're built to be able to quickly fill that rumen and then go hide while they digest it. So, you know, they're, while they're exposed, eat as fast as they can. They're basically swallowing food whole. You know, they're, they're not chewing it hardly at all. They're chewing it just enough to get it down. Then they go hide, and when they're in the safety of cover, they regurgitate that food, then they chew it, so it's nice small pieces, swallow it again, and then it can go through their digestive system. So that's a real uh, adaptation they have to be able to you know, minimize the amount of time that they're exposed to prey. And think about it, because the stomach that they have, their entire stomach you know, is maybe that big around. Think about it if their whole stomach was actually that big around. What's the one thing they would lose if their stomach was that big? They wouldn't be nearly as fast, would they? They wouldn't be able to jump nearly as high. So they would lose a lot from a predation st avoidance standpoint 
if they had to have it. So it's pretty cool that they have this nice little small stomach that they can just fill with leaves and stuff quickly and then go hide while it digests. Well, we know the deer molt twice a year. Here they have this nice pretty red summer coat that is really thin, it's really light, and it's actually designed to shed heat. It's rid of heat, so you know, to help keep them cool. They're not standing in front of a fan or certainly don't have any AC. We get into late summer, now they molt into their winter coat. The winter coat is either gray or brown, depending on what part of the country they're in. There's a lot of deer in Texas that have a lot more silver and gray in them, uh, but uh, it's either a grayish or brown. And even here, you can see this buck in front. He's still in velvet. His uh, red antler is just starting to shed out. So this is still very light. So at this time of year, it's in a winter coat. It's still pretty light, though, because it's not cold yet, but it's going to get thick and heavy, and now it's designed to hold that heat. And that same coat a couple months later is going to look like this. It's going to be so thick, and it's crazy how they can hold all that in. They literally can lay in the snow and not melt the whole thing out. They can hold that much of it in. So it's a pretty cool adaptation to have within those specialized hairs to be able to do that. That summer coat can't do that, but that winter coat absolutely can. Well, we know that deer are way more social than most people realize. Extremely social. You know what? But let's start from the tail end. We talk about them as being white-tailed deer. White is way more than just a tail color here. The reason is, we talked about the vision. They see well into those long blue wavelengths. White is part of that as well. They see white way, way brighter than we do. This essentially is a beacon for them, particularly in low light situations. And white-tailed deer, it's not just the underside of the tail that's white, right? The whole rump is white and the whole belly is white. That's not by accident. This is because this is what makes it easiest for them to follow others, particularly in heavy cover. So deer get into cover. What do they do if they're running away from a predator? Flagging, right? <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, they might be letting the predator know, you know, ha ha, I see ya. It's more so for other deer in that group to, here I am, here I am. And in low light situations, it's like this. This deer looking at that, that is a huge like, follow me. Here I am. It's like being a ship on the sea in the fog. You're looking for that lighthouse, that blanket. This is exactly what deer have by having that whole belly, that rump be white. Based on exactly how their eyes see best, this is what allows them to do the best job following others, and particularly when they have to do so at a very fast rate. All right, well, it starts with fawns then. From a fawn standpoint, we know that all the fawns born in New York this year, Pennsylvania, and anywhere else, about half of them will be buck fawns and about half will be doe fawns. You know what, the way we can tell the difference, if you look at every doe fawn has a rounded head, every adult doe has a rounded head. Every buck fawn has a flat head. This guy's pedicles have just started to set a little bit. They may pop through the skin, you know, if he gets a little bit heavier, but even look, look how flat his head is and how rounded her head is. You can tell the difference of every fawn by looking at this. And this is especially true right now when they're in summer coat or this light winter coat. We get into the, you know, December for sure and they have a heavy coat, it becomes more difficult. But right now it's super easy. And same thing with adult does. You can tell an adult doe from maybe a fawn or a particular buck fawn that's almost as big as her just by looking at this head. If you want to see a little more on this, we actually just put out a video looking at separating an animal this deer in the field. Actually goes through, it's a 16, 16 and a half minute video that talks about the differences between you know, fawns and adults, buck fawns and doe fawns, but then goes through a whole video series where shows deer, real hunting situations, and okay, here's exactly how we can tell. This is an adult doe, this is a doe fawn, this is a buck fawn, and then it has, uh, I think, 16 deer on there. It's actual quiz for you. This is on our YouTube channel. It's all free. You can go and see it. So then it, after we go through the teaching part, it has those where it's like a real hunting, actually it's all hunting uh, videos where you're sitting there, a group comes out, and then you get to pick, hey, is this an adult doe or is this a fawn? And if it is a fawn, is it a buck or a doe? So something that you can go and grab. Not fun little thing to show with, you know, folks you're hunting with or maybe people are on your land or just to learn, you know, a quicker way to be able to ID these deer in the field. Well, Fawns are not odorless. We talked a little bit about scent and all that. And some people say, you know, fawns are odorless. And that's why mothers, that's not true. Fawns have an odor. That's how the mothers identify them. That's how she knows, oh yeah, this one's mine. Oh, this one over here is not mine. 
day-old fawns will even rub urinate. They put more scent on themselves. Now, they don't have as much scent as their mother, which is one of the reasons she does send them off to hide and is not with them. But they absolutely do have a scent. But now this is a predator avoidance mechanism. And so what they'll do is, yeah, they'll feed, and then she will send them off to bed. She doesn't know exactly where they are. She knows the general area. But if she walked them somewhere and laid them down, that has her scent all the way to it, it'd be more likely that a predator could find them. But just by sending them away, that helps keep them a little bit safe. So what they'll do then is they go and hide, and then they will come and nurse usually three to four times a day. And for the first couple of weeks of life, they don't move a lot at all. You know, they literally will hold tight for those first few days for sure. But you literally could go and pick one up. They're, they're built to not run at that point. They can actually slow their heart rate down. So their breathing slows, their heart rate slows to make it even harder for a predator to find. And now, but after a few days, then they'll get up and run. And after a couple of weeks, um, they can outrun about anything. So it's that first month that's so critical for fawns. So they get past that, it's, it's almost impossible for a coyote or a bobcat or anything else to catch them. So they certainly get some, but not many at that point. So it's the first month that they will get most. <clears throat> so they'll start nursing immediately after a couple weeks. Their stomach actually can begin that rumination process. So they will start eating forbs, clover, and other things that are out there, supplemented in there with that milk. And by about 10 weeks, they can be weaned. So think about that. Most of the fawns born here, they're on the ground by June 1st. It means like by mid-August, most of the fawns are, can be weaned. So that period happens way before our archery season starts. You know, and that's by design. States want to have that season start after the vast majority of the fawns are weaned or certainly weanable so that, you know, to be able to create healthy situations. However, fawns will continue to nurse way after that. This is actually a picture from our place. I will promise you this fawn was on the ground by June 1st. This is actual date, November 7th. And that fawn, you know, is, is still nursing. I don't know this for sure, but my personal opinion is, even after they're weanable, they often will still nurse once or twice a day. But I think it's just a bonding thing with the mother and the, and the fawn, you know, because it's very common. We see this all the time, all the way through this. Fawn doesn't need milk, and it's probably getting almost nothing from its mother. But... You know, this is something that is not uh, uncommon by any means, so uh, I personally think that's what it is. But, you know, this is a fawn that's certainly been weaned, um, or weanable, I guess, probably is getting very little milk. It's several months old at this point, but uh, still continues to, to nurse a little bit. All right, mother of the year. There's a lot going on in this picture. You know, we can look at it and say, yeah, that fawn is nursing, that's pretty cool. But what's really going on here is, I think, one of the coolest things about deer. One, sure, she's, she's giving some milk here to this fawn. But when fawns are born, for the first two to four weeks of their life, they can't urinate or defecate by themselves. When I was in graduate school at the University of New Hampshire, I lived at the deer research facility. When all the fawns were born, we took them from the mother after 48 hours. That allowed the fawns to get all the colostrum and all the antibodies they needed. Then we took them and we hand-reared them so that we could work with them for research projects. We fed them every two hours at the beginning from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And every time you fed them, when you got done, you had to stimulate them to urinate and defecate. So essentially, you rub their genitals. That's what makes them do that, and then you could clean all that up. Well, in the wild, the mother will do that. And you can see here, she's licking its genitals. It's doing that because then the fawn's not urinate or defecate where they're laying, so that scent is not there to attract a predator. But more importantly, probably what's going on here is any bacteria that fawn has in its body that's causing it you know, to, to either not thrive or not be as good, as that's expelled, the mother is eating that. It's in her body. She then develops antibodies to fight that bacteria. They get, end up in her milk, so then the next feeding or feeding after, it gets fed back. So it's basically a medicine being fed back to that fawn to kill any of the bad bacteria that's in that fawn's body. That's a pretty cool mechanism. I have an awesome mom. My wife is an awesome mom. Neither one of them are doing that, I promise you. So that's, that's why I put up here, mother of the year. That's what's going on. When you look. This is also why when people take fawns from the wild and think, oh, this is cool, I'm going to go home and feed it. This is a great thing. And they realize, ooh, it's getting bigger. Wow, it's like really bloating. The reason is, you know, for the first couple of weeks, the fawn can't expel any of those waste by itself. 
So well, that's why those, a lot of those deer end up dying from all those waste inside. You know, it just can't go to the bathroom. So, because it doesn't have its mother to take care of it here. But that's what's going on here. So, pretty cool. Hmm. All right. So, for a little doe biology then with this, in deep body condition, fawns will actually become sexually mature that first year. So, fawns born, you know, this May or June, if they get to be about 70 to 80 pounds live weight this fall, they'll breed this year. It usually doesn't happen until December or January, but they absolutely can they become sexually mature that first year. But most deer don't breed until they're one and a half years old. That, that's the norm. How long do they stay in heat once they actually come into heat? Anybody know? It's a day to a day and a half, so 24 to 36 hours. This is why bucks often will lock up with a doe and stay with her before she comes in heat. Then they might breed her repeatedly for 24 to 36 hours. That's why sometimes with a buck, you know, he literally may be with a doe for a couple of days and move very little during that time of the year because of this. This is how long they're in heat. For whatever reason, if she doesn't get bred during that, she'll cycle again in about a month. And then when she does get pregnant, somewhere around 195 to 200 days before that fawn will be born. So it is what it comes out to be here. So pretty cool. Most adult does will have two fawns. Um, the exception is the first time that they breed, they usually will only have one. You know, and three fawns is pretty rare. Even in really, really good habitat, it's rare to have triplets. And even if all three of them do uh, hit the ground, it's really a uh, good chance that, that all of them are not going to make it. Even in some of the most agricultural parts of the country with lots of food. So one usually the first time, two fawns after that, and then uh, that, that's typically what they'll have for the rest of their life. One cool thing about does, though, is they are absolutely territorial. We often talk about bucks being territorial during the rut, and they got the rub line and this. And the reality is bucks aren't territorial at all. Does are, though, and they're, they're territorial during the fawning season. They will absolutely drive other does out of an area. They'll drive other bucks out of an area. They'll drive their phones from last year if they're still hanging around away from them. You know, and they can do this violently. You know, they'll stand up and box each other. So this is not a, okay, you know, it's time to leave. You know, this is a very forceful thing. They want those deer out of there so that none of those other deer are around for the new fawn and they're not bringing any of the other scent in. This is one of the reasons from a habitat standpoint, if you're managing habitat from a fawning end, you want good fawning area spread across the whole big area. You don't want a bunch of it in a small area because it minimizes the number of does that'll use it. They'll drive those others out. So by having good fawning area interspersed across the property is way, way better. All right. Look, yes, sir. Hey, question. Like if you have a doe as a fawn, and like the doe gets hit by a car. So there's another doe, or is that fawn? Will it, will it adopt that fawn? Yeah. In most cases, another doe will not adopt that fawn. If, if that fawn is old enough to kind of make it on his own yeah. and travel, it is old enough at a point where the mother is allowing other deer to be near her fawn, she will tolerate this orphan fawn kind of hanging out with her fawn. She's not going to feed it but she can provide some security for it or certainly help it learn how to avoid predators by just allowing it to be around her. But uh, if they're real young and still entirely dependent on milk, then yeah, they're, unfortunately they're gonna die as well. All right, let's shift the gears in and talk about bucks. Similar to does, buck fawns are capable of, of breeding if they hit that 70 to 80 pounds that first year, but there's very little breeding in the wild that actually happens with these. In most part is, even though they might be sexually mature, they're often just not tall enough to connect the parts, at least not with adult does. That research facility that I talked about in graduate school, we had a pen of fawns and we had pens of our other deer. One of our does got her, it was in the rush, it hurt her leg and she was limping really badly. And the buck that was in there kept trying to breed her. So I took her out and I put her in the pen with fawns just to give her some relief and I went out the next morning, this was way before cell phones, everybody had a camera, I know. but she must have come in heat or because there was a buck fawn that had mounted her, but he wasn't tall, so his legs are like this, nothing is connected. There was another buck fawn on his back, and another buck fawn on his back, so there was three buck fawns in a row, all of them large enough, they were all sexual, they knew what was going on, they knew what they wanted to do, 
And if they only had a ladder, they could have, but uh, none of them were tall enough. Same thing in the wild. So a buck fawn in the wild certainly could breed a doe fawn in the wild, the occasional, probably short or a small doe as well. But even if those buck fawns hit sexual maturity, there's probably not much of that happening in the wild at all. So almost all of that's going to happen after they become one and a half. They then are going to grow. Oftentimes they'll reach maximum body growth somewhere between five and seven years of age. And then often maximum antler growth is the next year or one year after that. Now, if we provide better groceries for them, they can reach maximum body size maybe a year earlier. Um, but all the food that has to go to antlers, think about this. Our deer are going to lose weight in the winter. So next spring, the first foods are going to replace all that weight they lost. Then the next foods go to body growth for the year. Anything that's left over gets to go to antlers. So that's why you often get the largest antlers after that deer has achieved maximum body growth because it doesn't have to grow anymore. So just more nutrition that can go up there. So we're lucky where we are in that most deer breed during the short periods of the year or during the fall. When I lived in Florida, we had deer that could breed almost year round there. And actually in Florida, there are literally, these are documented, seven different months that deer in that state are in the rut from South Florida up through into the Panhandle. You literally can hunt rutting deer in Florida from July through February. So, and as you get closer to the equator, deer will breed year round. We live far enough north that it's basically, you know, our deer breed, most of the vast majority of them are bred over a pretty short period into November. And it's all dictated by amount of photo period. So each day now, you know, we're just getting a little less light, a little less light. Deer's eyes pick that up, sends a signal to the brain, all kinds of hormonal changes occur, which that's what then hardens those antlers, stimulates the reproductive organs, and then, you know, makes all that fun stuff happen once they're in hard antler. So they're kind of buddies when they're in velvet. All of that changes when, uh, when those antlers get hard and that velvet is shed. And this is all driven by testosterone. It's all driven by photo period, but then it's regulated by testosterone. So peak breeding in for us, November. We think about it as, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good time of the year to be hunting. But think about it, the real reason for this peak in breeding has nothing to do with the fall. It has everything to do with when fawns are hitting the ground. How, how long is gestation? 195 to 200 days. So they breed in November here so that fawns hit the ground when there's something green for the does to eat to feed them. Does have three trimesters when they're pregnant. They breed in November. They put almost no energy into that developing fetus until the third trimester. You know when the third trimester starts? Right around mid-April. What also happens around mid-April here? Green up. You know, that's, so they are perfectly designed to need all that nutrition to grow that fetus when they have resources available outside. So that's why it's important that they breed on time and they're not breeding, for the most of them, they're not breeding in September or October or they're not breeding at the end of November or December, the vast majority are bred over about a two week period in mid-November so that the peak fawn drop occurs when there's food for them, which is pretty cool. At the other end of that spectrum then, in January, as we start days getting a little longer, a little longer, same thing. Eyes pick it up, the brain figures this out, testosterone levels drop, and this is what allows those antlers to fall off. And most of them will fall off in February or March, there's certainly there's certain things that can make them fall sooner or hold them a little more, but that's when most of them will fall. But let's spend the rest of the time talking about all that cool stuff that happens between velvet shedding and before they get rid of their antlers. Bucks are in bachelor groups. We love to watch them during the summer with this. And generally, they will do this from when they lose those antlers all the way through the spring, summer. And then when they're in velvet, they're all buddies there together. Testosterone levels are low. You know, they're all friends. But as soon as they harden those antlers and those testosterone levels are climbing, that's when suddenly all these bachelor groups break up. They don't want to be around each other anymore. Hard antler is when all the fun stuff happens. This is when it's time to start beginning preparations for the upcoming breeding season. Essentially, a deer lives with two things on its mind, the need to feed and the need to breed. That's it. Everything they do is dictated by those two things. The vast majority of the year, it's the need to feed. They have to accumulate a bunch of food. Every deer is going to eat about 2,000 pounds of food a year. Smaller deer eat less, bigger deer eat more. But on average, 2,000 pounds. 
They only take little bites at a time. So 2,000 pounds, that is a tremendous amount of food, and it takes a tremendous amount of time to do that. So most of what they think about is feeding, and that one very short period of time of the year when they have to, when the rut is on, almost everything then shifts to that. But what we're seeing, we've been seeing this for almost a month now, this all thing starts with sparring. And this will occur even before they shed out of that velvet, and it'll extend right up to just before the peak of breeding season. Essentially, what's going on here is they're figuring out where they are, figuring out exactly what they have antler-wise. You know, all those antlers are full of nerves. So when they're in velvet, they have a pretty good idea of what's there, but they don't know exactly. They don't go and look in the, you know, the crick in the morning and be like, whoa, like Bambi, look at the reflection. Like, man, you know, I'm going to have a good antler day today. That's not happening. You know, they're not looking in the mirror. They know about what they have. But I can see what this buck has. So some of the sparring is, I'll you know, put the head together, you see turn a little bit. That's exactly figuring out, okay, now I know exactly what I do have here. Think of a deer that breaks an antler off. He doesn't continue to act like, oh yeah, I still have all those antlers there. He knows immediately what is on there or what is not there. So it's pretty cool to know exactly what they do have. With the sparring enters are pushing each other around, if you watch this, almost always ends with one of them smelling the forehead gland and then licking the forehead gland. Who's doing the licking? The guy who's bigger or the guy who's smaller? Smaller. Because he's figuring out, he wants to make sure that he knows exactly. This dude is bigger than me, or at least is tougher than me. If during the breeding season, I come in contact with him, I want to make sure that I know it's him. So the, the forehead gland carries all kinds of information about bucks. So he's making sure he knows exactly who this is. And essentially what they're doing with this is they're developing their pecking order. Just like chickens, just like dogs, just like kids at school in many cases. So they know, Breeden's okay, he's here, I know exactly where I fit in to everybody else because they don't want to fight. Fighting can be very dangerous or even deadly for them. But that obviously happens, we see it happen, and now with social media we see it more than ever. Partly because we have more cameras, more social media, but also partly because we have more older bucks running around than at any time in the last 150 years. So, and this is where most of those big time fights are had. With these, it's almost always between bucks that are three and a half or older. Certainly one and two year old bucks can engage in this, but they don't often. This is the middle age of these older bucks. It's almost always over a doe. Common thing, right guys? It's almost always, this is, a, this is part of the problem. They're violent, they're vigorous, and they can end in death. So deer don't want to do this. So if bucks don't want to do this, how do they end up fighting? Many times what they're fighting is somebody that they don't know. We develop all of our pecking order here. We know all of this, we've got to spar, we got to do all of this. What's one thing that happens during the breeding season? There's a lot of movement. There's some bucks from the next town over that are in. And buck so oftentimes these big time fights are by individuals that don't know each other. They didn't have the ability pre-rut to develop the spar or develop that pecking order. There's a hot doe here, this buck, and I, know, I think I'm about as big as he is. Deer are far more likely to back down with a deer that they don't know or they haven't developed that pecking order during the breeding season. So that's where most of the big time knock down, drag down fights come from. It's by bucks that didn't have that chance in the pre-rut to be able to settle that easily with just a little bit of spar. All right, well, some of the ways that they communicate then Rubbing is a big one. We used to think that rubbing is just to get rid of the velvet off their antlers. That's not the case at all. They certainly can rub to get that off. But more so what they're doing is they're sharing information at these rubs. This will start during the pre-rot and this will extend all the way through the breeding season. And dominant bucks oftentimes will rub these same trees year after year. What they're often doing is they're coming in, breaking this cambium layer. This is a visual thing. At the same time, it's an aromatic thing, right? This is why bucks often will rub trees that have highly aromatic pines and some other things. Deer can smell it, and this is essentially a bulletin board. Because what do they do after they rub the tree, after they break the cambium on with their antlers? They rub their head on it, right? They're rubbing that forehead gland. Researchers from the University of Georgia have identified up to 50 different pieces of information that deer can leave about themselves in that forehead gland. They don't know what all of them mean, but they've identified that many different things. Deer know what they mean. It's likely things like dominance, you know, it, certainly identity, 
individual status. All, so they're rubbing it at that tree. So the next buck that comes along goes up and smells that and oh, okay, you know, geez, Bill's in the area, or you know, I didn't realize that Ted has been through here. This is how they're sharing information. Oh, this is their cell phone, being able to do it. So these rubs are a great way to keep an eye on. You know, if you have cameras, deer that are in an area, certainly the way that bucks are communicating. I was working in southern Kansas a few years ago with a landowner who ran a lot of cameras. We're going across the property, and I saw that way in the distance. And uh, I jokingly said, let's go back and see the pictures, you know, from here. And he said, oh, I don't have a camera on that. I said, all the cameras you have, you don't put a camera on that? He said, no, you think I should? I said, let's drive to that. Take, like, take me to that. This is what it looked like. I will promise you every deer in the county that went through here walked by this telephone pole. I said, if I only had one camera, this is where I would put it, right here, literally. Because this is, you know, they have almost, look, they have this thing wore down to none. I have seen the same thing on fence posts in North Dakota, Illinois, and we have a lot of trees here. So, you know, bucks tend to rub trees, but where they don't have to, they're going to rub something. And they love areas like this where there are no trees around, so that this forces even more deer to end up at one of these. This is the perfect place to be able to share information, and deer do it all the time. Does aren't rubbing on your earth, because, or at least from theirs, but they often are visiting these as well to check them out. Sometimes they'll rub their genitals on some of these rubs like this to share their information on who was there as well. So there's all kinds of info sharing that go on in rubs. Well, the other big way the deer share information are in scrapes. And these are, will uh, certainly be hit before the, the rut starts and will extend all the way through the season as well. And you know what? Deer will use scrapes 12 months a year. So they just tend to use them a lot more during the breeding season, but they can scrape any, uh, any time of the year, from January through December. Here. And there's a real sequence of events that has to happen for this. And one of the most important parts is that overhanging branch, what we call the licking branch. If that's not there, oftentimes, you know, the, the scrape is not going to happen. And if you have a scrape on your property that's real hot, maybe one of your hunting buddies is hunting that and you want to, maybe he did something to tick you off. If you go and remove that licking branch, you can stop almost all of your use of that scrape immediately. They have to have that licking branch first. That is what's most important. And you can see this deer here, they will often rub their preorbital gland on it, their nasal gland, they'll mouth it, they'll lick it. And then they'll smell it, and then they'll rub it some more. They get exactly the right smell on there that they want. This is not just a, yeah, I'll kind of rub my ear and move on. It's very specific, the smell that they want to get on that licking branch. This deer is not stargazing. He's smelling a licking branch, like to see what is there. What is there above it? Once they do that, then they expose that ground that's underneath. You know, if there's a brand new scrape, they literally will remove everything to make that dirt. And you know what, even if there's an area like, we're in a good spot for this here. If you go out tonight and find an area and just take a little circle in the woods or a field or wherever and remove the vegetation, just leave bare dirt, I will promise you deer will be there tomorrow. They, they can't walk by exposed dirt without checking it out because it's that wired into them to check those areas or share information there. Like you don't even have to put urine in it, you don't have to do anything in it. Just make a dirt spot and deer will come and check it out. So they're going to pull this out, and then many times they will urinate into it. And then sometimes they will rub urinate, which will take those tarsal glands and our back legs and rub them together as they're urinating. Some of this urine goes into the scrape, which leaves their scent there. Other goes on to themselves, which they carry their scent around for other deer to be able to identify with. But this is the primo way that deer are actually communicating with these. They often will see these at the edge of fields and woods. We can see scrapes all the time here, but it doesn't have to be there. We can see these in deer woods where two different vegetation age classes come together. Essentially, deer love to travel where there's more than one age class of vegetation. Any place that two of those come together are perfect spots for scrapes. And why are they perfect spots for scrapes? Because that's the perfect place that deer are traveling. That's where they want to travel, and they are scraping along those main travel routes. So even in the woods, totally wooded area, if you're going to find scrapes in there, they often are places where some of those different age classes of trees. And you know, it doesn't have to be big, you know, acres differences. You know, it can be very small cuts or whatever. But any place two different age classes come together is often where you'll see these. 
But you know what? There's a lot of times that deer will visit these and get information, but actually not be at the scrape. This is the scrape right here. This is the tree. This branch has been broken where they're licking it. This deer never did come in here at all, but he was downwind the whole way, collecting information from who has been here without actually stepping in here himself. Depending on the conditions, that urine that's there or any of the scent, you know, can remain there for several days. So they don't have to be right in the scrape to get it. You know, they can be down from that. So a lot of times they're coming here and checking this particular guy. Maybe he's had his butt kicked by a bigger deer in the area. As he comes here, he can smell the bigger guy has been there recently. So he decides, oh, I just, I guess I'm just passing through. He's not going to visit it and leave information to let some other guy know, hey, you know, Bill has been here. I'm going to go kick his tail again. So all kinds of stuff that's going on there. But you know what? Does will scrape too. Does routinely visit scrapes. Same thing, what guys have been in the neighborhood. And a lot of times they're marking them as well. Just as I said, they will rub their genitals on a rug. It's very common to see does urinate in scrapes too. So same way, this is their version of a cell phone, just like with bucks. And I'll tell you, if you have particularly a doe that has come into heat around one of these scrapes, I wrote an article for Quality Whitetails a few years ago. This was during our rifle season, and we actually have a slow season. End of archery, end of rifle, guys at our camp, they were complaining like crazy. They haven't been seeing many deer, aren't seeing any older bucks, I don't know what's going on. I found this scrape, it was literally, it was within 200 yards of our camp. Across the field and just in the woods, you could see the scrape from our camp. Um, going through it one day, I saw the scrape, I thought, ooh, this is pretty fresh. I put a camera on it. Well. I had a camera there for 13 days. In that 13 days, I got 88 pictures of 20 different bucks, all less than 200 yards from our camp. And it's all because I'm sure there was a hot doe, you know, that happened to come into heat. She was had visited this scrape, so all of these bucks had been in there, same thing. So these can be great places, community places where deer want to be. So with that then, is everybody going to go hunt over scrapes next weekend? The research shows in many cases, they're not good places to hunt over because about 84% of all scrape behavior occurs at night. So most of it. Now, if you shoot deer over scrapes, I'll be the first to say, keep hunting scrapes. You, know, you can't argue with success. However, I still think we can use this information to our benefit because even if most scrape activity occurs at dark, they are often traveling there and they get there right after dark or they're there just before daylight in the morning. Just knowing that, if I know there's a fresh scrape over here and I know there's a really good bedding area over here, putting myself in between those two and maybe kind of close to that bedding area is a great place to be if I know there's a good chance that buck is going to want to end up over there just after dark. So, or flip side in the morning, being able to catch them leaving those coming back. So, even though they often aren't the best place to hunt, just knowing where they are and knowing where they are relative to good cover can absolutely create a very successful hunt with that. So, well, I hope I said something tonight that was uh, at least a little knowledgeable, a little entertaining, or maybe something to, uh, to be able to get you a little bit closer to deer this fall, whether you start uh, here real soon in archery or, or wait a little more before we get into firearm season. But uh, one uh, ask that I do have of you, certainly be safe. Have fun, I guess three asks. Be safe, have fun, and I hope that you'll consider taking somebody else hunting with you at some point this year. You know, there are so many people out there that didn't grow up with many of the chances that we did to get to go hunting. I would love to go hunt, they just need to be asked. And uh, I spend a lot of time hunting with family and friends each year, but I always make time to take somebody new or to mentor somebody, you know, who hasn't been before. And uh, it's crazy how some of the years, you know, those end up being some of my favorite hunts of the whole year. You know, you know, with the excitement. I mentored a guy last year. Shot, he shot his first deer uh, while I was there with him. Crazy fun. That then this year now, he didn't grow up hunting, had always wanted to. Um, so shot his first deer. And this year, all, or at the end of last year, had already then mentored others who wanted to learn how to hunt as well. And actually uh, contacted me recently and is, and is mentoring some new folks this year as well. So, which I think is pretty cool. So he absolutely is paying it forward. So anyway, if you have a chance to take somebody, a kid or adult or whatever, um, you have a lot of fun with it. And, and certainly our sport will be better because of it. So with that, that's what I got, Sean. Any questions for Kip? Nothing.
a couple of things out of screen in a row. Um, just some observations. I have one place, it's actually on the edge of my yard, it's a willow clone. And every year, I call it the gym, the deer gymnasium. Because uh, there'll be at least 20 or 30 of these that are rubbed all just right mm. next to each other. Any theories on what's going on there? Or, uh, yeah, there's been a bunch of look, research with that. Because we used to think, you know, it's a dominant deer that's controlling that. And in reality of it is, it's not at all. A certain rub can have lots of different bucks that have rubbed at it. An individual scrape can have lots of different bucks scraping in it. And if there's been a lot of camera work, well, they will see like what we used to call a rub line. And they realize that, you know, a buck may come and rub this one, this one, skip these two, and maybe get these. And other deer will come in and get some of these. And so there's a lot of different bucks coming in, doing those, is, is what's going on there. Okay. And, uh, and if you had a camera that could monitor the whole thing, it'd probably be amazing how many different bucks are there, but then also some individual bucks would probably rub a bunch of those, others may just rub one or two. Kind of goes back to that whole uh, all deer have their own personality, they're individuals. Um, but in general, as deer get older, they rub a lot more than younger. So with that many, I bet you there's some older deer in there probably responsible for a bunch of that. Another thing that I observed over the years, seems like right now, like in the last week, I've found like 10 scrapes. Mm. And, but they're, this time of year, they always seem to be near food. Mm. They're not, you know, they're not widespread. They're mm. around my food plots or they're mm. in the acorns. But then all of a sudden you get about, oh, three weeks from now, and then there'll be scrapes everywhere. Uh. And you, you see that at all? I do, and I think that has as much to do with anything to do with the right. We are right at the edge of when deer are going to shift from those summer home ranges to their fall home ranges. So they're, they're right at the end of that uh, summer range, and that's the smallest seasonal home range of the year. That summer where if there's food and cover nearby, they don't go very far at all. So that's probably what a lot of that is, is they are scraping because they're just not covering a lot. All of that is about to change, yep. and then they, go, they cover much larger areas in the fall. So I think part of why you see it a lot more here in a few weeks is they're just covering more land, and then part of it is we're just getting closer to that breeding season where that, that scrape activity will just ramp up now all the way to peak breeding. And you can, if you monitor scrapes on your property, you can tell when the majority of does are being bred because that scrape activity will build just like this until peak breeding, and then it'll really slow down. But it will build literally almost every day from tomorrow up until peak breeding. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, I have a hunting friend that, that has this uh, coveralls that he wears. It has uh, some kind of a wire mesh sewn into the lining. Mm. And he claims that in the two or three years he's used that, he has a lot more deer come mm. a lot closer to him. I, ha I know what you're talking about. I have seen those systems. Um, I have seen the claims. Um, I am not aware of any data or any research on deer to suggest that those things work the way their advertisers work. Um, I'm not saying they don't. I just know there's nothing that they weren't developed based on research with deer to say, oh, this will defeat this part of their senses. Um, so I don't know. I personally have never worn one. Um, but if it works for him, he should keep doing it. He should keep doing it. I think probably as much as anything, it's kind of like your favorite fishing lure. You know, you tend to catch more fish on that, partly because you tend to fish that a little harder or you leave it on a little longer. Um, so th there's, no, there's no data to support that. That's actually defeating the deer's defenses. Um, but if he likes it and it's working for him, man, I'd, I would encourage him to keep using it. I've never heard of anybody giving off like the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you were talking about how deer use scrapes year round, which they do. Um, I found I have 32 stands, and I have I have a mock scrape at every stand site, and and I've I've done, I've had cameras on them all through the years, so I know they use them. They obviously it picks up now more, but I found that I could almost 
I want to say, but it, you can almost dictate their movement mm -hmm. when they're like cruising. Mm -hmm. Like you, they you establish these straight lines, so it seems like these bucks will fall. You can almost make them do. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't want my overhanging branch, I, I I'll take a flag bracket like you hang inside oh, yeah. your house, mount yeah. that to the tree, and I can just replace branches on it once one's dead, or, or if I yeah. want to move one from another place. And I have found I have, I've had great luck hunting scrapes, mm -hmm. usually pre rut, mm -hmm. just. 20th, 25th, 28th of October. Mm -hmm. I had great luck doing it, but you can almost predict, make them deer almost go sort of. I mean, I think it's just an established line of travel. They you know they, they they have a tendency to check these all through. Yeah. I just have, happen to have stands at all, all locations. Just but, so have you seen every like that where <laughs> like you can yeah. almost control? I mean that their movement sort of like that. I, so I I have seen what you're saying. Absolutely. Um, I don't know that you could control their movement. I know by doing that, you absolutely can make them move more. Yeah. And then, and but I know that then you absolutely it. can have some of that move around to strategic locations. Yeah, that's that's more in that. Yeah. And actually, I had a friend in Michigan that had a very small property who was an insanely avid hunter. That some of that, and in combination with some uh, uh, habitat manipulation, was done to keep deer on his property. He had like 40 acres. And uh, all of these deer were getting shot on his neighbors. So he did some similar stuff. And what it was is deer were still moving to the neighbors, but he essentially made them move around his property enough that it was dark when they got to the neighbors. <laughs> this is the time when they were shooting all yearling bucks. So every yearling that got off got shot. So he was trying to, you know, get some of them to pass through. So some of what you're saying, I have absolutely seen that. So, yep, I agree with that. So... Sure. And, uh, you know, mock scrapes are great. You know, you can, you can make those anywhere. Yep, I'm in the, the thing with the, the, say, you know, flagpole or stand, you know, you know, if you have, particularly from an archery hunt standpoint with larger food plots, we have brought lots of deer over the years into bow range, yep. either by just sinking a tree to provide them, you know, a four by four, or, or even just cutting a, a small tree and putting it in the ground. To provide them something to rub on or a T post, you know, with a limb zip tied to it with a little overhanging branch, you know, for like a. I, I just just, one in, at just a stand to location that I didn't bring have them quite to a, the right tree. I had a perfect tree for the stand, but not oh. overhanging branch. So I just, you know, yeah. you could just mount, mount yeah. it and you could change the branches in or out if you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. That works Absolutely. great. That's a great. They're so curious. I mean, they are really, really curious. So. I, I pee in all my scrapes too. <laughs> I pee in every one of my scrapes, and I'm telling you, I'm there with afraid you. it works. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. There's actually research on that. Penn State did some research where they had scrapes, and they looked, they used buck urine in some, doe urine, doe and heat urine, and new car smell. And the new car smell was attracting as many bucks as the doe and heat. So they did it again with human urine. It was attracting every bit as many. So it's not so much that it's, you know, the actual urine from deer that are in heat. It's... It's a smell. It's a smell that's in that dirt area that they cannot go past without checking out. So it's just what is there. So yeah, the whole lip curl thing where you know folks think, oh, that's how they tell if a deer is in heat. That's not how they tell if a doe is in heat. The whole lip curl, that flaming, they have a the vomeral nasal organ is right on the top of their mouth, a little diamond shape. Essentially, they're bringing in urine, just like a bowl, and the is bringing in urine or the the scent around that urine. They do that lip curl because that exposes that vomeral nasal organ and it pumps that scent in there. That goes to a part of the deer's brain that does not control behavior. Zero. So like people say, well, that's how a buck knows. No, no that's not. It, because it, it doesn't have anything to do with behavior. What it does is it goes there and it essentially keeps that buck, once the deer is, is getting to breathe, it, it keeps him in breeding readiness. It's like a daily Viagra for a buck to do that. So, but it's not controlling any of his behavior. They know that a doe is in heat by it's that time of the year. And what does she do to let them know it's in heat? She stands. Mm -hmm. Until she's ready, she continues to run. They will continue to follow, but she carries the scent of estrus on her. And then the only way he knows she's ready, it's not the urine, it's not the lip curl, it's not that. It's when she no longer runs away, that is when, that's how he knows. So, so anyway, yeah, you can save yourself a lot of money and... Uh, then you're not breaking any rules, right? You're not, you're not, you're not <laughs> natural urine or, or whatever. If your state doesn't allow it, you're, you're fine. Well, good deal. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, yeah. thank you for being here tonight. Good luck to see you.
you should marry her. 